again, I'm with VHB, and I'm uh, part of the team that's helping out on this project. A few quick things before we get going. For those of you who are there in person, and those of you who have joined us online, we appreciate you spending your time with us tonight to learn more about what's going on. Uh, we're going to have a presentation after which we will have some time reserved for public comment or questions. Those of you in the room, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can just wave Brandon and he'll call on you. For those of you online, um, you can either use the Q&A tool or if you prefer later on to unmute user microphone, you can hit the raise hand button and we can give you that privilege. Uh, we are recording tonight, just to let you know. And with that, as always, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Brandon Roberts from the project team. Brandon? Thanks, Matt. So as Matt mentioned, we're here for the second round of the NEK Regional Amenities Scoping Study. Um, here with me tonight is Jeff Doobie from VHB as well, and then we have Chris Hunt on the line who's going to start us off with a brief uh, overview of what's going on on the LVRT since the storm. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Hunt. I'm the project manager at the Transit Municipal Systems. Uh, I've been overseeing the project to earmark grants and the build out of the trail. Um, the segments that got completed last year. So, a uh, brief update on where we are with the assessment and forecast for the And uh, so the entire trail and catalog all, all my main major instances of washouts, um, erosion, and you know, larger and smaller damages throughout the trail. Um, as it stands right now, the more standard is centered from roughly Cambridge to Walden. Um, if all goes as planned, we're hoping to be able to reopen Swan to Cambridge uh, sometime this week, and uh, potentially St. Johnsbury up to Danville, maybe as far as Joe's Pond in the coming weeks. Um, nothing official to share on that now, because we're still trying to coordinate the repair work that's going to happen, but um, that's really targeting, trying to get some of the trail open right away. The other segments are going to be, you know, there's major damage out there. Yeah, everyone, I'm sure most people know, bridges out, culverts out, um, washouts in the trail, just major things we're going to need to address. We're beginning to program projects to deal with that now. Um, BHP is on board to help us sort of uh, engineer and figure out areas that we need to improve. Um, but some of that is going to carry over into next year. We're hoping to get started this year, but uh, just the reality of leave times for materials like replacing these bridges and culverts and getting contractors back focused on the rail trail when we still have one way work to do, it's just a tough time. So um, we are in the planning stage trying to reopen what we can and, um, and we'll be putting information out through the Rail Trails website, um, if you're signed up through uh, our listserv that we have for construction information, we'll be putting out information there as well. So hopefully a uh, formal announcement about segments that are reopened will be coming out this week. Um, uh, on the, I had seen questions about LVRT 14, the sign project. That one should have been going out to bid this week, but we pulled that back while we assess everything else that's going on. And um, we're going to hope to put that out later this year or maybe in the spring. It's really going to depend on how the chips fall with um, our you know, repair strategy for everything in the middle of the trail to the damage. Great. Well, thank you, Chris, for that update. Does anyone have any questions for Chris on what's going on from VTRAN standpoint at this time? All right. Barring none, we'll get started. One thing that I'll just uh, put out there is that um, since we substantially completed the construction that was going on over the last couple of years, this is transitioned from federal highway funding to FEMA funding, and it's going to fall under rail um, for coordinating these repairs. So Daniel Lockyer is incident commander for damage on the LVRT. Um, updates can go to him. Uh, but CC, Jackie, and I, and you can always feel free to reach out to Jackie or I for, you know, frontline questions before we pass those on. Thanks, Chris. 
So jumping into this, um, I'm going to start off by just handling some of the housekeeping, some of the stuff that we touched base on on the last public meeting. So we'll cover what we did previously, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, and Jeff is going to talk about what we've done since we touched base last and really get into the nitty-gritty of what's going on. Um, so just to reiterate who the project team is, I'm Brandon Roberts. I'm from VHB, and I'm the consultant project manager. This is Jeff Duby. He's the landscape architect um, for the project. Also helping us is Rose O'Brien. She's on virtually right now, handling that side of things for us with Matt. Uh, she's the project designer. We just heard from Chris Hunt, who's the project manager from VTrans. Jackie Casino is also assisting from VTrans with all things trails as the trails manager for VTrans. And then Annie McLean and Doug Morton are heading this up from the MVDA. And then we have a steering committee with one constituent from each town and VAST. Mike has been um, well involved up to date. So there's, some, there's a representative from each town, at least one, and then VAST and VTrans and the MVDA. So tonight we're going to talk about introductions. We just did that. We'll quickly touch base on the project scope and the purpose and need that was identified uh, previously in this project. We'll then talk about some takeaways from the local concerns meeting that we had about a month ago. Um, and then we'll get into the alternatives discussion and public input pieces of that. And then we'll wrap it all up by talking about what's next to finalize this effort. So to put all that into a timeline, um, we had the kickoff back in April. We did a bunch of field reconnaissance um, and also desktop review of the areas. We created base maps of the spots that we thought would be um, a good spot to possibly have a trailhead or some sort of local resource or connection into a community center. Um, and then we moved on to the local concerns meeting in May. That kind of summarized our um, research task, we'll say, for this project. So after we collected all of our data, we started developing concepts to try to meet the needs of each community. Um, so we're looking at everything from a community standpoint, but also a regional standpoint. So we're trying to figure out what maybe meets this community, maybe not this community, and how they all intertwine. Um, so we're here to present those concepts tonight. And then following this, we'll summarize everything, the whole process that we've done and our findings from the public meetings, public input, and our research in a draft scoping report. We'll come, and that's going to be throughout the month of August. We'll come back here and meet with all of you in September to present our final findings, we'll say, and summarize that scoping report. And then we'll provide a final draft of that scoping report by the end of September to conclude this project. Um, so something to quickly note is this is a scoping study. So this is the first phase in project definition. So use this type of project to define what a project for a community could be. And then wh what's next is called the project um, development phase. So we'll then take what was defined as a project, develop it into construction plan specs and estimate, do a construction cost estimate and all of that to then package it together, get a contractor on board, and get it built. So this is just step one of the three phases of project development. So to touch base on the purpose and need that was defined in the local concerns meeting, um, we didn't really get much input outside of this, this meets what everyone was desiring for the project. There's still time to provide input on all of this. Um, really, once we get through that draft project report, there is when we're trying to wrap up the um, public input piece of it. So if this purpose seems to have changed from recent events or throughout just further thinking of what this project is, there's still time to manipulate this as needed. Um, but essentially, the purpose was defined as the purpose of the LVRT NEK Regional Amenities Scoping Study is to identify opportunities to strengthen trail connectivity, provide a regional approach to the addition of trailside amenities, and enhance economic development opportunities with connections to trailside Northeast Kingdom communities. So taking that, we also identified that there's six different communities within this region that we're looking at. 
there may be a different need or purpose for each of these communities as we go through. Even though we're thinking about it regionally, we're also breaking it down to the community level. So we, there is an opportunity to identify changes in this as a regional perspective, but also as a community perspective. And you'll see as we go through the presentation that we have this same statement just pasted when we talk about each town. So we can manipulate it on screen as needed um, as we go through the presentation. The second half of this slide is a clip from our scope of work just to further identify what we're looking at and the limitations per community that we had. Um, we understand that these are vibrant communities that some have more resources than others. We could go down a whole wormhole of looking at 16 different places per town. The goal was to really identify what is an equal opportunity for each community. And the second statement more or less states that we were going to look at three opportunities per community, a total of 18 opportunities throughout the region, and this included connections, trailheads, local amenities, and regional amenities. Any comments at this time on the overall purpose, and purpose statement? Barring none. So local concerns meeting recap. Um, we identified the draft purpose and then we talked about each community's needs. We brought it down to a conversation based on town level, um, what each town wanted to see. We started at the steering committee level, then we worked it through the public meeting and then brought it back to the steering committee and made some refinements. So we'll talk about those um, as we get to each town, um, but that was the gist of the first part of it. Um, we also discussed the existing conditions, some of the natural resource impacts that may be expected based on our findings, um, and some of the other challenges, but also opportunities that each community has. Lastly, in the original public meeting that we had, um, the things that were key topics that we kept circling around to when we got to every community was bike parking and security. So not just providing a spot to park your bike and walk into town not knowing if your $5,000 mountain bike is gonna get jacked, um, but also giving opportunities throughout the communities, maybe some sort of web camera or something that gave you a line of sight from where you are. We talked about maybe bike parking would possibly be more beneficial at some of the destinations within town because maybe town's half mile away. You don't want to park and walk half a mile when you could easily ride on a local road half a mile. Um, so we talked about some of that stuff. We also talked about additional parking and also trailer parking. So we understand that there's a major need for snowmobile users throughout the winter parking their snowmobile trailers and also equestrian users throughout the summer parking their horse trailers. Um, we also talked about overnight parking and some different nuances about parking and what the right level for what community is for the various types of parking. Um, and lastly, we talked about connections to and from the trail. So not just getting trail users off the trail to town, but also bringing them back to town. How we do that with different wayfinding um, practices. There's actually a guidance document that we're working with VTrans on currently that addresses community wayfinding as a whole, no matter what the connection is, whether you're leaving the trail via sidewalk, shared road, a um, local trail connection, all of that is defined within that community wayfinding guidance document and we're hoping to utilize those practices on all these trailhead projects going forward. I know this is not NEK related, but we're currently doing that same process for Swanton right now, who's in the next phase of this with project development um, for their trailhead. We're identifying all of the wayfinding throughout town to and from the trailhead. So just to recap what towns we're talking about in the NEK here. So we have St. Johnsbury where we're at now, um, Danville just west of us. From there, we touch Cabot quickly, and then we're up into Walden. Um, we also are talking about Hardwick and Greensboro. So tonight, we're only going to focus on Cabot, Danville, and St. Johnsbury. And for those that haven't heard, tomorrow night, we're having a second public meeting over in the Hardwick town, um, office there. Townhouse. townhouse, thank you. Lost the word for a second. Um, so over in the Hardwick townhouse, same time, six o'clock, same format, but we'll be talking about Walden, Greensboro, and Hardwick at that time. Um, something else to note is we're going to do a 
backwards tonight. So anyone that's been following along, we've gone St. John's Berry to Hardwick in every conversation to date. We're gonna bring it backwards. We're gonna start with Cabot, then we're gonna touch base on Danville, then we're gonna go St. Jay, spice it up a little bit. Um, so final slide here before Jeff takes over, but just to reiterate the intentions of tonight. So we're looking to go through each concept that we've developed for each community, talk about the opportunities, talk about the challenges, and in the end, we're really looking forward to identifying maybe what the first project should be for each community. Not necessarily the only project, but if the town had one pot of funding money to do one project, what, the, what that alternative would be. So we're looking to move forward with a construction project of one per community. So we're looking for all of your input for that. Um, and to that note, for anyone that hasn't seen it, there is a survey that we created. It's on the NVDA website, as well as a copy of all of these alternatives in PDF form for you to be able to go through those on your own time, fill out a public feedback survey, um, and provide your input to us. That's very important. We have received some input to date, but would love to receive more. So the link for that is on the flyer. Anyone that doesn't have internet, I have printed copies. You can fill it out and give it to us by the end of the night. That would be well received. Anyone who's looking for the link to it, it's on the flyer. I have a couple copies here and I can hand those around and people can take a picture of it or whatever you want to do. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, who's going to talk about each of the alternatives. Cool. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so thanks again for being with us tonight. My name is Jeff. I'm the landscape architect with DHB. Um, we're going to start in Cabot tonight. Cabot's a little bit unique in that the opportunity is a little bit different from some of the other communities, given that a smaller segment of trail goes through Cabot, and the trail itself, it's rather removed from downtown. But throughout the process, we did identify this need from the community and LVRT users to connect the dots between the LVRT and Cabot downtown. It's a little bit tricky. There's a lot of grade to contend with, but we think there are opportunities there. And along the way, there's a lot of cool stuff to see. Um, we're talking about defining connections between the LVRT, Burt's Orchard, um, the AM Foster Covered Bridge, and the town center. This will take place along gravel roads primarily. There's some options for more experienced bikers or more confident bikers along Route 215 if they're feeling comfortable with it. Um, but along with that, just improved wayfinding, wayfinding signage to again connect the dots between the LVRT and downtown. It might not be a ride that people are looking to do, um, you know, that day, you know, hopping off the trail and going to Cabot, but it might spark their interest for a next ride or a return visit. So um, it's good to just promote visibility of Cabot for that reason. And with that, we're talking about a potential for a level one trailhead. If you've been following the management plan, this level one trailhead would be more of that light touch with the trailhead. It functions more somewhat as a pause place. It gives people an opportunity to step off the trail, catch their breath, maybe wait for a friend that's um, sightseeing a little bit more than them behind them on the trail. Um, but also this opportunity for us to have a kiosk map that that has that wayfinding signage ability, again, to make people aware of where they are on the trail, but also aware of their place in Vermont. You know, Cabot's not that far off the trail. You know, maybe they're getting back to their, their trailhead destination where they parked their car, and they see um, some promotion for Cabot, and it, you know, gets them curious about it, and they hop in their car and they go downtown. Um, it could be a really good way to get people, you know, curious about downtown for that reason. Um, with this, there's two swales along the side of the trail. We will have to contend with one of them. Um, so there's some uh, drainage improvements that we need to do under the trailhead itself. But beyond that, we're really talking about a light touch with the kiosk map, one sided with the LBRT, the other side being more material about Cabot itself. And then a few benches and um, some planting to sort of define the trailhead, create shade for folks. Yes. What is that crossroad? I can't quite see it. Yes, thank you. It's Brickett's Crossing Road. Um, it's not too far from the Route 215 intersection. It's a nice gravel road. Um, it's in Walden. Thank you, Brandon. Um, <laughs> there sort of touring the sites um, so you can imagine somebody either pausing along that road or taking your route downtown yes 
to downtown if folks were curious. Um, I could see this being, you know, a day where you're on part of the LVRT, part of the route down to Cabot, uh, you know, being a gravel road around, along Cabot Plains Road, it's got a similar look and feel to the LVRT itself. You've just got a, a few more hills to contend with. So that's part of the disclaimer. The route from the LVRT down to Cabot, it's pretty hilly. Um, it might not be the family ride, but it's certainly possible. And along the way, as you can see, there's the A.M. Foster Covered Bridge, there's Cabot Plains Cemetery, and there's Burt's Apple Orchard um, along this green route, Cabot Plains Road, as well as some really nice walking trails through the Cabot Trails Network as well. So we've identified two routes, both about six miles. Um, one relies on the Cabot Trails Network itself. The other one in green along Cabot Plains Road is all along a gravel road. Um, beautiful ride. Again, it's um, just a little bit out of the way if, if you're not looking to go to Cabot as part of your ride. Um, and again, a little hilly uh, for folks uh, with families. But along that, we're talking about wayfinding signage to sort of connect the dots, sh highlight the route for people, but also opportunities for interpretive signage a lot along some of these um, amenities along the way, whether Burt's Orchard or um, the A.M. Foster Covered Bridge, etc. Yes. I'm not sure. I sat in a few of the work meetings in Marshfield, and there's a strong desire to connect the cross from Montreal in Marshfield up through Capital Two from the BRT. So, yep. this, so, like, bigger picture like that could be a potential, yeah, mm -hmm. really cool connection. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, on the top of this page, you're seeing Vermont 215. Um, this is a, a bit faster of a roadway. There's higher traffic volume. It's a paved road, but it, doesn't have the, the widest of shoulders, so it's a bit tricky again for, for folks with families, but it is our shortest route to get from um, the Walden 215 trailhead, which we'll talk more about tomorrow, down into Cabot. Um, this, these other routes you'll see, these would start from that first level one trailhead that we were just discussing at Brickett's Crossing Road. Could you just, I'm sorry, I can't see anything on this map. Could you point out where that Brickett's Crossing yeah, is, that is on this map and then yeah, it's it's start to so that's that's the crossing right there. Okay, thank you. So yeah. so the LVRT is which? The purple? The purple. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Got it. Gary, we didn't have the opportunity to walk the whole route um, on our field recon, um, but Gary, thanks, thanks for the update. Um, it certainly looks like a nice route. It's primarily wooded, that, uh, this connection in orange here. Um, the other one, I, I think, goes through a couple farm fields as well. Um, very nice, very nice area. What is the trail surface? Uh, the trail surface is, it appears to be gravel, mostly. Okay. What's that? An earthen surface. Yeah, earthen surface. Is there another channel on mine? Survey. Oh, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, just for you, excuse me for hearing, you know, is there a way, I'm not familiar with the trail network, but is there a way to just I don't believe so. Gary, did you hear the question from Amy? Oops, sorry. Let me make Gary up. Let me make Gary up. Uh, hang on just a minute, Gary. I'm going to promote you. This will make this easier. <laughs> Congratulations, Gary. Promotion? That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the local knowledge. Gary's going to reappear in just a moment. Always good to bring in the subject matter expert. All right, Gary, you should be able to unmute uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, with that from Andy, I, I 
somebody that would eat it. Yeah, yeah sorry, I was just curious if there is a way, maybe it isn't direct, but if there's a way to connect from relatively close to Brickett's Crossing where the Chabot Trail Network is shown on just the trails to down to the village center? Um, and it, the sound is breaking up, so maybe someone else can yeah. repeat the question. Yeah, Gary, the question is whether or not you could get from the LBRT to downtown Cabot utilizing the Cabot Trails Network exclusively. Uh, no, uh, not at this point. You would, I mean, essentially, uh, you could, in the closest point to uh, the LBRT, if you went down, with its crossing, uh, you're kind of heading, I guess that's somewhere southwest, uh, to that short road, which is called the Green Road, and then the dotted line trail is the Green Trails, which is a network of trails. That's just probably the shortest route. Um, but then the rest, the rest of the way, you know, you, you couldn't do it all on off-road. Off you would have to do it on Class 3 and Class 4 roads. So Class 3 would be kind of Plains Road down to 215. Uh, or Gray, which is uh, Class, mostly Class 4, I believe, down to the dotted line, down to Nard Road, which is Class 3, and, and then down to Hill Road, which is Class 3. So no, you couldn't do it entirely uh, off, off road, but you could do it on Class 3. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. And then, so as part of this as well, we won't get too far in the weeds here, but we've been working through an evaluation matrix, and this information is available online for folks who want to take a deeper dive. Um, but this would go through, through a number of different um, potential impacts or whether or not it's meeting the purpose and need for each trailhead. It's sort of a way for us to evaluate which might be uh, top in priority, if you will. Not, again, not necessarily the only project, but what might rise to the surface in terms of meeting that purpose and need and while fitting in, into a budget there. So, of course, there's the option of, of doing nothing in this area, but for that level one trailhead that we explored, we're looking at about $120,000. Um, again, we're sort of contending with some drainage improvements with the swale along the trail. Um, that's certainly taking up a bit of the cost, but um, that's sort of where we land with that, that first area there. So any questions on Cabot before we move on? The approximate distance between the Cabot and the next trailhead heading east. Ooh, you're testing my knowledge. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know, Mr. LVRT? Hmm. I don't know if I have file markers. Uh, I don't know. What is that, West Danville? Yeah, it would be yeah. West Danville. So that's 15. Yeah, right. 15 miles there. Yeah. I don't know what it is out there, but it's 15, mm -hmm. roughly, at yeah. Joe's Bond. I'd say that's 7 miles. Okay, yeah. So, so it presents a uh, opportunity for the rest of the area. Yeah, exactly. And then tomorrow we'll see more about the Route 215 trailhead. That would be continuing west, and that can't be more than 4 miles, I would say. It's not too much further. I think it's like two miles away. Yeah, right. Cool. So next up was Danville. Again, we're, we're traveling in a different direction tonight. Um, so the purpose need is largely the same across the towns. Um, if folks feel otherwise and that we need to revisit this for a specific town, definitely chime in and let us know. Um, but the need here was really, again, enhanced connections between the town, uh, the trail, and overflow parking as well. Um, this was an area where folks identified the, the need and desire for increased trailer parking as well. So we have uh, some talking points about that. And then also, it, it's really critical that we address the safe connection from the trail to Marty's. The, the community feels really strongly about this. We understand it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle. It's going to be a long conversation that's had there. Uh, but folks do really feel strongly about it. So we're presenting an option um, to explore that as well. We understand it's been part of the conversation for a long time, but folks feel really strongly about it, so we'll have more information there. So here we are, this is Marty's. Um, North is sort of down to the right on the page. Marty's is on the right, and we're looking at the LVRT on the left. 
Um, in the middle is the treatment plant access road. There's a small modest parking area there currently on the bottom of the page that you'll see. Um, I think it's about four or five spaces. We would propose increasing that as much as we can with it, without too many impacts to the wetlands at the south, the bottom of the page. And beyond that, um, folks have, you know, express the desire to increase the parking area in this zone um, north or above the treatment plant access road, sorry, north is <coughs> here. Um, but this would be sort of impinging upon the stormwater management facility owned by VTrans. We think it's possible to maintain the stormwater management facility with only uh, slight modifications to the berm at the management facility. And with that, we can get a few more parking spaces as well. And increase visibility of the LBRT as well through a kiosk and some bike parking for folks that want to utilize that crossing the street to Marty's. Um, in addition to this, we are exploring this idea of crossing of Route 2. Again, it, it's, it's a long conversation that's going to be had with VTrans in the community, but you know, we, we do feel it's important to improve the connection there. We found that the better alternative would to be to travel, I guess, west on Route 2 just slightly um, to connect the, the trail crossing to an existing sidewalk facility, rather than to send people immediately across Route 2 from Treatment Plant Access Road into a median or directly into a drive aisle for Marty's. Um, we do feel it's safer for pedestrians to connect to an existing facility, um, even if it's just a short walk out of the way, if you will. We do think that people would appreciate the safer connection rather than darting across. Yes. Is the crossing of the rail trail by ladder beams also part of that conversation? No. Um, no. 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 To my knowledge, no. Um, so with this, there would be some sort of um, enhanced warning signage, and hopefully some signage at the crossing itself, whether it be rapid rectangular flashing beacon. It remains to be seen if, again, it's that part of that longer conversation. But with that, we would be providing some sort of sidewalk connection south of Route 2 with improvements to drainage in the existing soil in that area as well. So any questions here before we move on? Yeah. I just wanted to point out we did oh, uh, we did have a question come up um, for the online folks. We just wanted to share the question and the answer with the folks in the room as well. Uh, somebody asked if there's going to be a bathroom at the Cabot Trailhead or parking um, and Rose answered on Thank you. Nor would we anticipate restrooms being here as well. Um, we think there are other amenities and other trailhead facilities that would be better served for that. Yeah, I just or, want to say Doug is going to help us facilitate the discussion with the trans yeah. to, to get this. But this is going to be, as you said, it's going to be a long conversation to get there. And you know, we could throw in the Larry's crossing, but I think we have to sort of do it one step at a time. So we'll get this figured out and then because we also know that's that's a safety issue. What does this have, so people right now walk up the hill a little bit, cross the road, down the hill to Marty's. Is that right? That's right. Sure. 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 sidewalk facility that's already in place rather than having people dart across the road into a driveway for Marty's essentially. Well, they're really active. Are you familiar with? What's that? You, you know Marty's. Well, yeah, and I so, saw it. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if that's, yeah, because I, the other cost are sort of like there, like, you know, on place. Question in the back. Uh, is there any thought of doing anything around, um, Junctions of 2 and 15 there at East Dean Store. You got to have extra parking. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Getting there. Getting there. There's there. three concepts for Dan Hill. Yeah, this is just the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah.
next one tasting store here. <laughs> All is quiet on the online front. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, before we get to that, um, I'm turned around too, so thank you, everyone, for bringing me. Um, so, this is the train depot in Danville, still, along Peachum Road. Um, we understand that there's been conversations ongoing. This is a project that ha has been has been working through the process. So there's we're building on a on a concept that's already out there in place already. Um, part of that is the the parking lot facility it, itself. Um, the other part of that is the train depot restoration um, and sort of the platform restoration itself along the LBRT. So we're building on that, improving on it with some other additions of amenities that sort of build out the whole site and an offering to folks using the LBRT. Um, so with that, just modest improvements to the parking lot, we, we identified the, the need and desire to have a more formal ADA connection from the parking lot to the trail itself, rather than utilizing um, a dip in the grass area that we anticipate plenty of other folks using. We just wanted to have a more formal connection. The other component um, is, is really just providing the signage to identify the trailhead itself. And, that's, that's part of another project that will be installed, I guess, next year, hopefully. But beyond that, we're identifying the, the opportunity for amenities south of the LVRT itself, where we have a few picnic tables. We have the kiosk, of course. We have bike racks. They're sort of uh, existing on site with a repair station, but we understand they'll likely be moved once the train platform is reinstalled and reconstructed. So we're locating those south of the LVRT itself in that lawned area. With that, we're showing, again, the kiosk, but also the opportunity for unique historical interpretive elements. Um, we understand there's a few mile, mar mile markers that need to find a new home along the LBRT. In Danville, um, Peachum Road specifically was identified as that potential location. So it could be a great opportunity to sort of connect the dots between what was and what is now. Beyond that, we understand historic, or in the past, rather, a sidewalk connection from Peachum Road and the LVRT up to downtown was explored in other grant and other opportunities. Uh, we do think it has a lot of merit still, so we're continuing the conversation there. Again, in 10 here, this connection of the sidewalk on the west side of Peachum Road connecting up to where the school entry road is. Um, at that point, there is an existing sidewalk that picks up from the school entry road to downtown Danville. Um, with that, of course, is the appropriate wayfinding, wayfinding signage to connect the dots between the LVRT and downtown Danville. So there are bathrooms. Um, we have we have to a lot of the construction here for the um, renovation of the train station, and so there are bathrooms including an ADA accessible bathroom, and then there's water, also water stuff right there. And the Danville train station committee are also working on some conceptual very preliminary plans to do additional parking in sort of the bottom of what your map is here and also up the picture um, near the school, as you see in the school entrance. Because there's really only really eight parking places right here. I'm going to fly here at the train station. Did you say Bond Street? I'm sorry? Did you say Bond Street right here? No, 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 additional. At the school? At the school. In addition, they're exploring opportunities for parking south of the trails that we had said before? North. Mm -hmm. Up at the high school. Oh, north? Well, both, both north and south. Oh, okay. Yeah, on both, both sides, yeah. Yep, yeah. so south of the trail in this general area, but then also north um, up on Kingdom Road where the school access road is, likely at the school itself, right? Laura? Somewhere. In there. Somewhere up there. <laughs> Did, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know. Other people have uh, have visions of where it's going to be, but I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it's just In addition, Laurel mentioned that there will be water available at the train depot as well, correct? Right. There is right now. Yeah. Awesome. Any other comments? 
I just wanted to point out while we're on this, um, you may see some of the amenities offset on the cell side of the trail a little bit. We know that there might be a little pinch point here with the platform from the depot building, especially for snow groomers. Um, so that is was taken into account with the offset that you see the amenities offset from the trail to the south to make sure that the groomer can maneuver around the platform. Awesome. And then so lastly, this is the Hastings store. This is um, this one's a, a bit different in that we are using a planned project as part of our understanding of existing conditions. Um, you may have noticed some work going down on Route 2, um, but within the next year's construction cycle, there would be work being done at the park and ride itself along Route 2 at the junction of Route 15 in Danville. So part of that would be to um, change the configuration of the parking itself at the park and ride. We understand um, it functions and looks a bit differently uh, as it does today. So currently, there's there's two-way travel lane, and two lanes of parallel parking. The proposal from VTrans is to um, narrow it down and create head-in parking along the south side of the parking area against the LBRT. Um, we understand that this is a big, a big site being used for trailer parking, whether it be equestrians in the summer or snowmobiles in the winter. So this isn't really meeting the needs of the community. So with this in mind, we wanted to revisit you know, earlier concepts that we had proposed, revisit this concept as well, and sort of reimagine what this might want to be uh, in the future to meet all users of both the park and ride and the LVRT as well. So with this as sort of the baseline existing conditions, um, we've revisited the parking and sort of the alignment of it to create a one-way road through the park and ride, heading, uh, I guess, east, if you will, and then instead of head-in parking, explore this angled parking opportunity that would give us enough space to do a single lane of parallel or pull-through parking north of the park and ride. That would be our opportunity for trailer parking. It's a bit different than it works now, but it would maintain the opportunity to cater to all user groups of the site. Um, if we wanted to, we could explore this idea of head-in parking along the south side of the park and ride to maintain um, the two-way travel lanes and parallel parking on the north side of the parking lot. We just run into some challenges perhaps with realignment of the trail. Um, there's a lot of grade change um, south of the LBRT and a lot of forested area. Um, but it is a possibility that we could explore in a little bit more detail if, if folks are curious about it. But for now, this first concept at least maintains the ability to have trailer parking on site. Um, in addition to that, we are proposing a few amenities that would sort of align the Hastings store, the existing crosswalk, with proposed amenities for the LVRT, keeping safety of pedestrians in the forefront of our minds, not wanting folks you know, traveling across with families or, or anybody really to have to mix too much with vehicular traffic or walk into a row of parked cars before they get to their nice picnic area. So sort of maintaining that alignment of where we folks, where we know folks want to get to and where they want to be at the end of the day. So with that, we're showing kiosks, we're showing picnic tables within this plaza-like environment, in, in addition to bike racks, bike repair station, and enclosures for portable restrooms. Um, just one moment here. Additionally, we are maintaining the existing bus stop and shelter, but also uh, looking to improve some of the connections between the existing bridge and, ter and interpretive signage and the LBRT is itself, in addition to um, expanding that mountable curb or that curb area um, to sort of define the parking area and the roadway itself, and additionally looking to screen a bit of the hydroelectric utilities south of the trail to sort of uh, maintain that, that comfortable, positive environment for folks, either through shrubbery or large canopy trees that sort of defines the trail and sort of breaks up the space from busy route to traffic route to traffic and the trail itself. Um, so I'll go to a question in the back. Yeah, what the net gain or loss was, would be on parking uh, availability there? That, yeah. That's highly used mm -hmm. by, you know, uh, people frequently facing this area. You know, mm -hmm. We haven't done the numbers. It's a great question. I should have this information available. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, 
it, there's, it definitely comes within that cost of parking, I would say. Um, we can follow up with that information. But I would say at least this, this concept would improve the ability to have that other user group with trailers on site, whereas the current concept sort of limits that opportunity. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So I did a road trip the other day, um, and I can tell you 19 spaces right now, one handicap included with that. Okay. So that's what you have with the current layout. I don't know what VTrans has planned. That's the VTrans plan there. Yes. Yeah, that's about 30 spaces. You would use it as a parking lot, too. Yeah. It is a parking lot, right? yeah. 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 It's also a yeah. So uh, the other thing that's not in your rendition that is in the V-Trans one is the hydrant. Uh, so that relegates that area as a non-parking area. That would be about tree number one, two, three, four, about six. Tree number six from the bus. Stop. So you're saying this here? This area here? Oh, there's a, oh, oh there's where the bus area is. Okay. So right, just right here. Right here. Um, a little further back. That's where the hydrant is. Okay. Towards the bus stop. Between where your phone was and... Got it. We'll make sure we, we have that indicated on the map and okay. take that into consideration. And then I'm not sure what the extension is. The, so the item is marked number 11. Uh, the buffer between Route 2 and the parking lot. I have no idea what the... Yeah, so, the, so going back to an earlier conversation, like you, others, and yourself, you had expressed concerns about turning movements with trailers. Yeah, I just didn't know how far it was. There's no, no uh, distance uh, listed as to how far they were going to extend. Okay, yeah, this does follow what the trans is planning. Um, we can follow the dimensions. Okay. Um, but yeah, the intent, you know, we could explore a mountable curb option that would give us the ability on the ends at least to make a wider turn radius okay. if tractors need or trailers need to head back westbound. So we go back to the V trans one. I think they mark off in stations. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what a what a distance the station is. Uh between the numbers that are called out are hundred feet. Those so, are yes yeah, hundred feet. So so this is nine thousand four hundred feet. This is nine thousand five hundred feet. Okay. So each tick is 25 foot intervals in between. Okay. And the existing median ends about here. I'm sorry, I'm pointing with my hands, but the existing median ends about here, so it's maybe about 150 feet of extension that's being proposed. Okay. You want to summarize that for? Yes. So Mike was asking about the extent of um, median extension from the VTrans concept and looking at some of the proposed concept from VTrans appears to be about 150 feet. Yes. So by default, the Joe's Palm uh, Beach has become the overflow parking for a lot of people, and I know the kiosk is there as well. Is the kiosk moving from there to this location? And is there some sort of understanding about what people can and can't do at the public beach so in terms of parking? The um, the uh, West Vanville Community Club mm -hmm. runs the beach, and they would prefer it not be a trailhead. Yeah. So that's why we looked at it different. Yeah. I mean, people are going to buy, they're going to park like they park there, yeah. but they would prefer it not be a, a, a designated parking trailhead. Um, and then the kiosk, we think we're probably going to move that to the train station because we were going to put a kiosk in there anyway. And so there already is a kiosk here. There already is a kiosk here. here. And the, the main thing about the parking ride is that's, that's a, State parking yeah. So we can have all kinds of plans, but it's their it's their yeah. property. Yeah. So we can express our concerns and our wishes and hopes and dreams, yeah. but it's going to come together. Yeah. It's already pretty crowded. So for folks online, the conversation was centered around the existing trailhead facility at Joe's Pond and whether or not that use was being encouraged or discouraged. And currently. It is going to be discouraged at Joe's Pond, and that needs to be encouraged at this park and ride facility. Um, there's an existing kiosk facility at Joe's Pond, but that would be moved to the Danville Peachum Road site, and this existing facility, the existing kiosk at the park and ride would likely be upgraded and improved if this project were to be built. Last nice question. Yes. The V-Trans concept shows some angled parking in front of 
I'm not sure what the name of the place is. Right. Yes, so on Route 15. Is that part of the, the concept as well, or is that just a rendition of the V Trans? My understanding, is right. yeah, my understanding is that's part of the V Trans. Um, it wasn't really part of our scope to reimagine what was happening in front of those private businesses okay. and residences yet. So just to add, I know that the Danville uh, Joe's Pond thing was brought up. We are under LVRT 14 adding signs right before that entrance to encourage users to not even go into that entrance to continue to a LVRT designated parking ride or parking lot, sorry. So that is already in, in effect under LVRT 14 when that gets actually put out for construction. I have a question for Mike. Okay. For anybody who's, who's operated uh, trailers in and out of that location. So with, if you can go to your rendition, so you have, if I guess, the, the stationing, it's maybe a little more than 25 feet on the eastern end, and then you know, you've got a bunch of metal bulk curve on the western side. Is that enough? Um, How much more do you need if it's not enough? It depends. because. Uh, the other one that I think of is um, as bike tours, given the popularity, uh, they're going to use trailers for uh, holding people and, and bikes. So they too will have that issue where it's a one-way. I'm not sure if they're going to designate parking against that, that buffer. Uh, and, and I'm not sure what they're going to do on the exit side because I, I read that they want to line it with the trailer down the other side. So I'm not sure how that influences that and whether or not it gives us a greater radius to be able to turn a vehicle on a trip. I'd have to, right now in two dimensional, I don't have an answer for you. Because I, 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 I know we're operating large industry buses in and out of there, track trailers are in and out of there. So I don't know, Brandon or Jeff, if you guys can slot in what the turning radius is and make sure that we're actually satisfying all those users' needs. Like, is there a way for you to simulate that? So from a traffic standpoint, so what I worry about is 15, if the junction of 15 and 2, uh, so you're going to have right-hand turn and left-hand turn to be, if this is just a one way part. So that's, that's a concern because left-hand turn would be nasty. Um, from route two into the parking lot, right yeah. uh, especially for bus access. Yeah, yeah that's a sharp turn. So it's also we have the trail crosses too. So it's yeah. always a yeah, there's a well, yeah. the trail crosses down yeah. here. It's just a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very busy. Yeah. 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 And Understood. It's highly used. Understood. So the conversation is um, whether or not we would have the turning radius to move trailers safely in and out of the parking lot facility if the drive aisle is one way. And it sounds like Brandon and our team needs to do a little bit more research in, in terms of understanding what that radius wants to be and the length of that bulk curve. And just so everybody understands, the reason I'm a little fixated on this, this really is the only place where we can have a, a large area to turn those kind of vehicles. The parking areas that we see, they would be challenged to have a truck and trailer. Okay. Lastly, can you tell me what that Sign is sorry, maybe a, it's those it little it look like half moons. Um, I mean, by utility pole. Oh yeah, sorry. These are, these are just the handicap designated okay. spaces. Thank you. Yep. So I've set the two-way conversations up. This dash line right here represents our rough estimate of where widening of the parking area would have to go to. And as you can see, we intersect pretty quickly here, so to create a separated space from the LVRT, I don't know, I mean, we looked at it on the way here again, but th this is a pretty steep hillside and heavily vegetated, so you're looking at cutting in and then right away is right here. You're gonna see some challenges in this area to make it two-way. Here's obviously a little easier, but this would be head and park and two-way drive and parallel parking still. Okay. Um, just 
children find that to be an important feature. So not cutting off all visual access. Not so important. Sure. Awesome. Thanks, Jillian. <laughs> Jillian reminds the group that children are often very amused by the hydroelectric facility, um, and perhaps that's not something that needs to be screened entirely. Thanks, Jillian. <laughs> Um, my kid's in the same boat, I'm yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, where are people, so people are walking for a ride, but where are they crossing and getting? So, I'm sorry, the, the question? Where are people crossing Route 2 to get to the other? So they'd be crossing <laughs> right here. Down the bottom? Do you mean on the trail? Or? On the trail. Yeah. On the trail. Yeah. All of those are off. You're crossing yeah. on the trail. Right. Okay. Not part of this study, no. no. That's out of the scope of this study. That's another really darting place. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a tricky spot. I mean, the other place darting was bad, but we have to dart here. <laughs> so, just to, so the purpose of the study um, was really for uh, trailheads and then amenities for those trailheads. Okay. So, right. so, so when you, you're, you're asked really good questions about the crossing themselves. Well, well, yeah, because before Mars was darting not good, here all you had to do was dart. Right. There's there's definitely a few spots on the way over there too that are, are a bit challenging from that aspect. Both ends. Yeah. Yeah. Both ends. That one's worse. Are there any other comments or questions on the trailhead itself before we move on? Hearing none. Hearing none. Oh, we just had that question come up in the Q and A. Sure. Um, Awesome. And we're, we're, we're so not able to see how up there you go. We moved the cursor. So it's in this area right here. <laughs> we would not be changing that by any means. That's part of the, the VTrans comment or concept as well. Maintaining that area for the bus stop and shelter and the fire hydrant. So we're not proposing any changes there. Yeah. Okay, if you go to the VTrans concept, you'll see the little black dot where it's right here. So yeah, perfect. So. Um, as part of the evaluation matrix, again, just exploring different conflicts or whether or not the trailheads are meeting the purpose and need, as well as trying to come up with some estimate of cost. We see the Marty's as being the most affordable, if you will, but also just recognizing some of the challenges with that, that conversation that needs to be had with VTrans and the community in terms of getting that project actually built. Um, so a bit tricky there. Um, that comes in at, at about $180,000. The railroad depot is about $670,000. The park and ride at Danville is about $340,000. Um, they're all very doable projects, it seems, with the exception of Marty's, of course. Um, there are some impacts to stormwater and drainage, etc. cetera, um, but you know, nothing in terms of constructability that would really prevent it from happening aside from the crossing. So, just in recognition of time, moving on to the last town, St. Johnsbury. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Take a oh, right. Thank you. Brandon reminds me that now is the time to pick a project, the whole point and purpose of this meeting. Um, we recognize that this might be a broader conversation with other considerations to be had. We look forward to um, seeing the results of the survey that come in. Um, in making that ultimate decision, as well as conversations with the steering committee. But wondering if there's a project that sort of rises to the surface, either in person or online. And if it's easier to fill it out in the survey anonymously, feel free to. Uh, you can rank like them in order, I think is how we have it. It's a drag and drop kind of situation, so that's easier too. Uh, we also understand that there's most likely funding for the depot one that's separate already. The Route 2 one has some challenges, but also some opportunities to fix the challenges that VTrans might be creating with the paving project uh, in a more immediate time frame. And then the Marty's one may have an elongated time frame to navigate some of those challenges with the crossing. So, might be worth strategically thinking about how the funding would be laid out too. 
just a clarifying question about the club park and run. If, if the project committee and the community wants to pursue that one, what is that just looks like securing funding for plans that would be suggested to be trans in place of what they have now? Do you want to speak to that? Sure, the question was how would we proceed with the park and ride and what would be the first step more or less. I would say the first step is a conversation with VTrans. It is a shared facility, mostly maintained by them, but I believe that there is approval currently for LVRT use at all state park and rides currently was the agreement, if I remember correctly. So I would say that the first step is to have that conversation, go with this concept, have a good sit down conversation, figure out what they may want to see, get some sort of conditional approval to proceed with something, navigate some of the hoops that they may throw at you coming out of that meeting. And then once you get into a step that may be agreeable, then get into a design contract. And that, that all of that could also, we could help navigate that too um, under a supplemental agreement, but that would be my way of going about it. So just to clarify, it's not like that pro that project would still need funding outside of each end. It's not saying, hey, let's do this, and they say, okay, and they fund it. Yeah, and no. Like, okay. The question was the timing of the V Trans paving project, more or less, with funding, and that project's already out the door. I mean, you can you can file a complaint. They do have a public information officer for this project. Um, you can file your concern or whatever challenge you may have with it. Um, to that, they have a website, if you look it up, I forget the website off the top of my head, um, but I think this is called the Marshfield Danville Route 2 Paving Project or somewhere along there. So if you Google that, there should be a VTrans link with an email that you can file your thoughts to. But at this point in time, I don't know how much they will change since the contractor has already been given a contract to do the work. Uh, wanted to jump in with a follow-up from uh, Chris Hunt. Perfect. Uh, Chris, he says, I believe Dando PNR was the only one specifically authorized, but we have been approved to use it as a trailhead by a Federal Highway Association. Specifically? I thought you said St. John's very well. St. John's very as well, but that's a town-owned one, is that right? Or is that no, also state owned So the St. John's owned one too, I believe, Chris. Chris, you can go ahead and unmute this company if you like. Yeah, sorry, I was talking about the trans you know, federal highway funded ones. We had to get approval to make that uh, transition in use. But for town owned, yeah, it's totally out in towns. Would you agree, Chris, with that process that I had mentioned on how to navigate that? Yeah, otherwise everything was fine. I just wanted to point out that other V trans ones we haven't specifically gotten authorization for besides the Danville one, but they are open to it um, and we've done the preliminary work to make sure it's an approvable idea. Thank you. So were there any thoughts in terms of prioritization? I know there's some different conversations rolling around in terms of how to actually get there, but um, in terms of what might fit the need most? Do, do any folks have some thoughts there? We could do show of hands. That's fine. Yeah, that could work. Um, so I guess for the first one, for, for Marty's, do we have a show of hands in terms of that being the highest priority? Three, four, five. Um, is there a way to measure online that? Yeah, that's a good question. Can people raise their hand if they're on? Good point. So we've got six in person. And I'll ask that Matt tallies up online. We can sort of do the tally after. Um, moving on to Beecham Road. Do we have a show of hands here for priority, being highest priority? And I'm only saying that because it's town and it's a, you know, the best chance of actually doing something. Yeah. <laughs> 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 funding out for that. That's what the cost. So Laurel reminds the group that Peach and Road is town owned, so 
sort of control your own destiny there. There's a bit more control in terms of how and when. Um, we, we have two hands in person here. Three. Three, thank you. So finally, um, the park and ride at Danville. Do we have a show of hands in person for that being the highest priority? Seeing none in person. <laughs> So at least in person, Marty's has it at six votes. So the kiosk would be in the parking area, not at the pavilion. 
Yes. Yeah. The, so the question is, the comment really, the kiosk would be at the parking area instead of the pavilion itself. The thought being that folks arriving at the parking area would want to get their bearings, understood how, how far the ride might be, different things they might encounter along the way, versus folks that are getting to the, to the pavilion already sort of have that understanding. Um, it's less about wayfinding on the trail, but more about downtown and opportunities that they might um, run into, run into downtown here. And then so my second question. And arts, yes, thank you. No, on the side of the pavilion. There's a kiosk that we painted. Sure. And this would be on the side of the pavilion. Yeah. Yeah. So my greatest concern about all of this is, is visually, if you're in that area, it is, it, it's so un uninviting <laughs> to go through that bridge and get to downtown. It, you know, it's just, to me, such a, a huge psychological barrier. And I don't know if that's beyond the purview of this group, but I'm just wondering how we envision actually making people feel like I'm going to go into that dark tunnel <laughs> and feel comfortable about coming out in downtown. Yeah, I, I thought the same myself, I'll be honest. So the comment is, um, you know, how do we make that tunnel and connection from the pavilion itself feel comfortable getting to downtown? Um, and I completely agree, it is a bit daunting at first. There's definitely some improvements that are being explored in terms of widening the sidewalk connection to make it comfortable for folks traveling through the space. But I think that art and lighting could go a, lot way, a long way in terms of widening up the space a bit. Um, it definitely does feel a little bit dark, um, but there are opportunities to create art along that walk, um, along some of the industrial buildings. I think there's already some interesting sculptures that are happening I guess on the west side of the tunnel itself. Um, so I think the, the potential is there. And that's included in the scope of our Northern Borders um, project is to enhance the tunnel itself. Okay. Um, we haven't defined exactly what that means. There's been conversations about brick pavers on okay. the surface, but just to make it a very pedestrian lane would really help too. Yeah. Lighting, um, and there's a future long ways out project group um, who trans can replace that tunnel. But that's just barely identified, it's probably 10 years out. Thank you. So there's a comment in person speaking to this uh, study out there currently to look at different opportunities that can make that, that connection through the tunnel more appealing for folks traveling through the area. Yes, my turn. One of the struggles will be that's railroad property. Yeah, so it's not state-owned, it's railroad property. So that's, we have to go through that in order to affect any changes. Yep. Mike reminds us that it is railroad property under the bridge, so we would have to go through those agencies to make any improvements there. Who owns what would be the parking lot? I believe that's the town, no? The town is working to acquire that. Perfect. Who has it now? Yeah, so the question was uh, posed in terms of who owns the parking lot facility currently. The town is actively in the process of acquiring that parking lot. Any other questions before we move on? I do think it's, it's worth keeping in mind that that trailhead, potential trailhead, could also potentially be a trailhead for another proposed rail trail, possibly, mm -hmm. right? Um, Connecting over to New Hampshire. Yeah, if you go to the previous slide, <laughs> you know, shaking his head, he doesn't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to the anyway, maybe <laughs> 50 years from now, that's if this a small that, purpose trail. This right here is the Twin State Railroad, <clears throat> and it connects behind mm -hmm. the Portland Street Bridge. This is a, a uh, bridge right there. Um, and so there is a group actively working to uh, get that. At the very least, it serves as business on the other side of the so there's a comment and reminder in person that this trailhead facility could serve two trail rail trail functions in the future if if the stars align. Who knows? Um, but hearing no other comments online, I'll jump to the next site. This is on Main Street. It's just south of Bay Street. Um, this is sort of the end of the LBRT and where the Three Rivers Path extension would pick up, leading to downtown St. Johnsbury. So this concept picks, on this, picks up on the idea of that trail extending downtown. 
So this concept would really look at um, sort of clarifying how existing parking is uh, functioning on site, but also um, looking to the future, to that future path connection on the Three Rivers Path, and accommodating that in a way that is safest for pedestrians and folks looking to not end their journey here on Main Street, but continue to the north just a, a little bit further. So with that, we're again sort of clarifying how parking is, is occurring on site with head-in parking, but also looking to add a, a kiosk map, sort of reconstruct what's there now, um, relocate it or provide an entirely new one, again planning for that future path connection, but also planning for some benches along the Sleepers River, sort of looking out over that area, um, but also looking to add a few bike racks and bike repair station as well. Um, of course, with that comes the appropriate wayfinding signage to, again, encourage people to travel north to downtown St. Johnsbury, but also the trailhead entrance signage to let people know that they've arrived at their destination. Um, with this, we would look to maintain the existing retaining wall that was invested in and constructed to build this uh, parking area in the first place. Um, but really just reorganizing a few amenities to create more of a pause place and, and gathering place on Main Street. Any comments on this site? Even that, we talked about this before, even that kiosk, if it just went the other way, it could be both sides. That's the challenge with the current orientation. So there's a comment um, just reminding us that the way the kiosk is currently oriented on site, the back side of the, the kiosk panel faces the woodlot and there's a steep grade that travels uphill. So it prevents St. Johnsbury from sort of advertising both the LVRT and amenities downtown. So the plan here would be to present it in the middle of the plaza or gathering space so that um, folks with the LVRT and St. Johnsbury could sort of do double duty and have their double-sided kiosk. Yes? Is this a net increase in parking, saying less? You know, I haven't, we haven't counted um, the existing parking on site, based on the way people are currently use it, it's probably about the net same because people tend to come in there and you know, park par parallel to the drive aisle when they really could be maximizing parking with head in parking. Mm -hmm. So this would sort of clarify how they're, they're intending to park on site. I think it's probably you know net neutral at the end of the day. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll move to our last site. Um, this is a light touch in terms of a trailhead proper, but this is the park and ride along Route 2. Um, so here the intent would be to sort of clarify how people are getting from this overflow park facility at the park and ride up to the LVRT. So you've got to travel on sidewalks, you've got to travel uphill a little bit, but really just trying to make sure that people understand how to get from this overflow parking area with potential, trail, with potential trailer parking up to the LBRT. With that, we understand that the, the sidewalk route currently does meet existing standards, but there might be improvements that we make to the actual crossing of Route 2 to make it a bit uh, more user-friendly, but also safer for people. So with that, we would suggest um, widening the median from uh, a currently existing four feet to at least six feet, ideally eight to 10. Um, we, we understand that we have the space to do it with the existing travel way width, um, so it shouldn't be too much of a lift to get there, but that would be sort of the first step in improving that connectivity from the park and ride to the LVRT. Um, along with that would be a trailhead kiosk and signage that uh, clarifies how people are to use the sidewalk connection. We wouldn't want to keep, put um, pedestrians or bicyclists along Route 2. We would ask that they dismount their bike at the park and ride facility and walk along this green um, sidewalk connection that you see across Route 2 until they get to Mount Vernon Street or High Street to either mount their bikes again and travel up to the LVRT or to continue along existing sidewalk facilities. Um, of course, with that goes the appropriate wayfinding signage to sort of get people from there to here. Um, but we think this could go, this could certainly be a helpful addition to folks looking to, to use this overflow parking. Any questions here?
Any questions online, I suppose, before we move on? Uh, it's fine. Thank you. Um, so lastly, we, we arrive at our evaluation matrix again. Again, we won't get into the details too much here. We invite you to look at it online if you want to see more information. Um, in terms of cost, the Bay Street, St. Johnsbury area is about $600,000. The Main Street at St. Johnsbury, about $160,000. The Park and Ride, it's a lighter touch, it's about $60,000. Um, we think they're very feasible projects. You know, we think that it could go a long way in adding to the, the value of the LVRT and what St. Johnsbury has to offer there. Um, but we look to you in, certain, in terms of prioritizing which one you'd like to see first, I suppose. So. Um, we can do it by show of hands. I welcome uh, verbal comments or written comments online to create a, more of a discussion around it, but I'm curious to see, hear what you guys have to say about it. A Street? Oh, Bay Street, yes. <laughs> An overwhelming show of hands for Bay Street. How many did you get, Brandon? I think nine. Yeah, exactly. We'll say nine. Um, do we do hands up for Bay Street online, Matt? Do we see that? If you're taking um, count. Anybody wants to go ahead and put their hand up? Go ahead and do that now. Laurel, you got a question? No, it's on the hand up. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Feels good. <laughs> uh, we've got one online user left, um, and I don't see a hand up. So. Awesome, thank you. Um, next, Main Street, St. John's Bay. Show of hands here. I think we had it a lot for Main Street. Um, finally, the park and ride. It's a, a bit of a different project, less of a trailhead. See none. Well, folks, I think Bay Street has it. Um, exactly. Thanks for bearing with me. We put together this amenity summary um, for folks curious in terms of the, the planning and sort of the spread of amenities. Um, we think that the Northeast Kingdom is very well served. There's a lot of awesome opportunities throughout the area. Um, so if you'd like to dig in the weeds on this a bit more, this gives it more information in terms of parking spaces, et cetera. Um, from there, I will give it back to Brandon to talk about next steps and hopefully get folks out here soon. Thanks, Jeff. So in conclusion, um, we met here today to meet again tomorrow in Hardwick so anyone that wants a little bit more of this touch of love please join us there um, we're asking for all comments and responses to the surveys to be in by August 11th and today so that way we can wrap up our thoughts and put it all together in a report by end of month um, the steering committee may think on that and may change that date but as of now that's what we're asking to move forward with um, and then we're looking forward to touching base with all of you again in September. So any overarching questions, comments, or concerns regarding what we saw today? Everybody have a chance to sign in. If you haven't signed in, please do so. We have copies of the survey and uh, copies of the flyer, which has a link to the online portion of the survey here. And then if you are online or want to take a picture of that with your phone, that is the same link that you will find on the flyer to get to the online survey. And that is also my contact information. If you want to reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns, I welcome that too. So if we wanted to see a copy of this presentation, is that that you just gave to we could look at with all the um, we have all the graphics like on the MVDA website. Okay, it's it's not a recording of this presentation. No, So there should be a hyperlink of the guidance documents that kind of outline what this project is, a copy of the PDF of the plans that we shared today, and then a link to take the um, feedback survey.